let me just uh, say a few things about Hans. He uh, is, uh, got his degree from Frankfurt University in economics. He, then he went to, the, uh, to America and studied under Murray Rothbard. At the uh, in New York, I think it was in New York, and and, and then he uh, taught at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Uh, he's a and he's a uh, distinguished fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute, with many other accolades and, and uh, credits to his name, including something quite significant, uh, which, which is called it's a strange word, a German word, a Festschrift, which is I can is a um, recognition, a published recognition by one's colleagues of, for one, of one's work and for, one, for one's work. Uh, he got that in, I think, 2009, was that right? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so we are very privileged and very honoured to have Hans here for this occasion. Um, and he is uh, adding a lot to the, uh, the Mises seminar. I've got to know Hans a bit by attending three times his, the Property and Freedom Society conference in Bodrum in Turkey. That's how I got to, to know him. Um, so uh, if you could all once again welcome Hans to the stage. Thanks again. My topic is politics, money and banking. And I hope in, in some way that in 30 plus minutes or so, I will try to explain to you all the things that you need to know about this subject, at least the most important, the most important things. You don't need to know much more than that. Um, imagine that, that you are in command of the state um, and the state I explained that yesterday in greater detail. The state is defined as an institution that possesses a territorial monopoly. Monopoly is an economic term uh, of ultimate decision making in every case of conflict, including conflicts involving the state and its agents itself. The same definition I gave you yesterday. And by implication then, uh, the state is a territorial monopolist with the privilege to tax, that is, to unilaterally determine the price that you, imagine you are the state, that your subjects must pay to you for you performing the task of being the ultimate judge in every case of conflict. Now, if you act under these constraints, or rather under these non-constraints, um, is what we refer to as politics or political action. And it should be clear in a way from the outset um, that politics by its very nature means mischief. Of course not mischief from the point of view of those who commit the mischief, but from the point of view who are subject to state rule. Um, Predictably, you will use your position as monopolist of ultimate decision making to enrich yourself at other people's expense. More specifically, we can predict in particular what your attitude and policy vis-a-vis -vis money and vis-a-vis -vis banking will be. Assume that you ro rule over a territory that has developed beyond the stage of a primitive barter economy and where a common medium of exchange, that is what we refer to as a money, is in existence. Now first off, it is easy to see why you would be particularly interested in money and in monetary affairs. <laughs> As a state ruler, you can in principle, of course, confiscate whatever you want and provide yourself with an unearned income. Again, recall, you are the monopolist of ultimate decision making. You have the right to tax and so forth. So you can confiscate all sorts of things. Um, 
But instead of confiscating various producer or consumer goods, you will naturally prefer to confiscate money. Why? Because money is the most easily and most widely accepted and saleable of all goods. Um, and by confiscating money, this allows you then, of course, the greatest freedom to spend your confiscated income as you personally like to spend it on the greatest variety of goods. First and foremost then, the taxes that you impose on society will be money taxes, whether on property or on income. And your goal as the ruler of the state will be to maximize your money tax revenue. Now, in this attempt to maximize your money tax revenue, uh, you will quickly encounter some rather intractable difficulties, however. Eventually, your attempts to further increase your tax income will encounter resistance in, in that higher tax rates will not always lead to higher tax revenue. Higher tax rates can also lead to lower tax revenue. Um, your tax income, your spending money, declines then because the producers, if they are burdened with ever higher tax rates, uh, simply produce less. And as a result of that, even though you have higher rates, you tax people at 90% or so, the income that you get will be lower because less is actually produced. So tax revenue can decline. In this situation, you have only one other option to further increase or at least maintain your current level of spending, namely by borrowing funds. And for that, you must go to banks. And because of this, you have also a special interest in banks and the banking industry. Now, if you borrow money from banks, these banks will automatically take an active interest in your future own well-being. Uh, they will want you to stay in business. That is, they want the state to go on in its exploitation business. And since banks tend to be major players in every complex society, such support is certainly beneficial to you. On the other hand, as a negative point, if you borrow money from banks, you are not only expected to pay your loans back, but you are also expected to pay an interest on top of it. The question then, that arises for you as a ruler. Again, I always ask you to put yourself into the shoes of government because that will help you understand how the current monetary system developed. So the question that arises for you in the position as the state ruler then is, how can I possibly free myself of these two constraints? The first constraint being tax resistance in the form of falling tax revenues, and the second constraint, the need of having to borrow from banks and to pay interest to banks if you want to increase your spending level beyond what you can achieve through taxation means. Now it is not too difficult to see what the ultimate solution to your problem is. You can reach the desired independence of taxpayers and tax payments and your dependence on banks if only you establish yourself first as a territorial monopolist of the production of money. That's the first step. On your territory, you simply pass a law, on my territory only I am permitted to produce money. But that is not sufficient because as long as money is a regular good that must be expensively produced, 
such as gold and silver, for instance, there is nothing in it for you as a state ruler except expenses. More importantly, then, you must use your monopoly position, a position as a monopoly producer of money, uh, in order to lower the production cost of money and the quality of money as close as possible to zero. Instead of costly quality money, such as gold and silver, you must see to it that worthless pieces of paper that can be produced at practically zero cost will become money. Now, I will not go into a great detail on how this process is going on. I'll speak on that subject uh, as a gathering on uh, Monday. But let me say this. Normally, no one would accept worthless pieces of money as payment for anything. Pieces of paper are originally only acceptable as payment insofar as they are titles to something else. That is, insofar as they are property titles. Um, if I would give you a worthless piece of paper um, and you would not sell me anything for it, uh, and even if I add unlimited numbers of zeros to the one in front, that would make absolutely no difference. You would still not sell any real good against pieces of money. So that pieces of paper were acceptable as payment at all at some point was due to the fact that they were just not pieces of paper. They were titles to real goods. Um, so in other words, what you must do is you must replace pieces of paper that were titles to real money, to gold or silver or something else that was a real good, with pieces of, pieces of paper that are titles to absolutely nothing. You realize, of course, that we have reached this position with the paper money that we currently use. They entitle you to absolutely nothing. Um, under competitive conditions, that is, if everyone were free to produce worthless pieces of paper money, uh, a money that is, can be produced at almost zero cost would be produced in a quantity where marginal revenue equals or approaches marginal cost. And since marginal cost, that is producing, cost of producing additional unit of money is zero, uh, the marginal revenue that is in this case the purchasing power of this money would be zero as well. Hence, the necessity to monopolize the production of paper, uh, of paper money. Again, realize, if everybody could produce paper money, it would be produced in such quantities, since it cost, can be produced at zero cost, that what you can buy for this piece of paper is also absolutely nothing. So it is absolutely essential if you have achieved the position where pure paper monies are in existence that you must be a monopolist. You must be able to restrict the supply of money in order to prevent that this money becomes entirely worthless. You must restrict the supply of money in order to prevent hyperinflation, which otherwise would be almost instantly a result if anybody could produce paper money uh, at will. And if you have hyperinflation, then of course all the advantages that you, and that I will explain in greater detail in a few moments, all the advantages that you have by being the monopoly producer of paper money would disappear because people would then uh, go to real values. That is, money would simply disappear from being used and instead people would just uh, use butter and uh, coffee and whatever it is as money, real goods again. Something that we have seen happening in any, every instance of hyperinflation. Now, in a way, uh, by having introduced a pure paper, paper money, you have then accomplished what all alchemists and their sponsors wanted to achieve. That is, 
you have produced something valuable, namely a money with purchasing power. Again, recall, with money, paper money can only keep purchasing power if it is monopolized, strictly monopolized. You have achieved a position where you have produced something valuable, money with purchasing power, out of something that is practically speaking worthless. Um, and this is, of course, a wonderful achievement. It costs you practically nothing, and you can turn around and buy yourself something really valuable, such a house or a Mercedes or a BMW or whatever it is, and you can achieve these wonders not just for yourself, but you can achieve these wonders also for all your friends and acquaintances, of which you will, of course, quickly discover that you have far more all of a sudden than you used to have in the past. Um, and among these many additional friends that you acquire by this miracle that you have, have achieved for yourself, among many of them will, of course, be plenty of economists, essentially all so-called macroeconomists, who explain then to the public why your monopoly is really such a great thing and good really for everyone. Now, what are the effects of this policy? Now, first and foremost, more paper money does not in the slightest affect the quantity or quality of all other non-monetary goods. There exist just as many other goods around as before. Um, now this immediately refutes the notion, which obviously uh, up to 95, maybe 99 percent of all mainstream economists tend to believe, that more money somehow can increase social wealth. Now this is just to believe this, that more paper money can increase social wealth. Uh, as everybody proposing, for instance, a so-called easy money policy as an efficient and socially responsible way out of any type of financial or economic troubles must apparently believe, is to believe in magic, um, is to believe that stones, or rather paper, can be turned into bread. And we emphasize again, this is the idiocy of the economics profession that we have in front of us. Practically every economist who appears on TV or is a big shot in the profession, uh, wins Nobel Prizes and so forth, obviously believes this type of nonsense. The greatest example of all is Paul Krugman. Um, I mean, this uh, Paul Krugman, you have to just consider more as, uh, as some sort of uh, comic relief, his uh, <laughs> economic comments that he writes. Now, rather, what additional money, the additional money that you printed will affect is, are two things. On the one hand, money prices will, of course, be higher than they would otherwise be. After all, there is more money that has been brought into existence, and the purchasing power per unit of money will be lower than it otherwise would be. In a word, the, the result will be what we call, in colloquial sense, uh, inflation. More importantly, however, all the while the greater amount of money does not increase the total amount of presently existing social wealth. That is, the total quantity of all non-monetary goods that exist in society is just additional pieces of paper. Everything else is just the same. Um, what it does, it redistributes the existing wealth in society in favor of you and your friends and acquaintances that is, those people who get the money first. Um, you and your friends are relatively enriched. You own a larger part of the total social wealth at the expense of impoverishing others who, as a result, own less. Let me explain why this is. That is, why income and wealth is redistributed, not increased in total, but redistributed. Those people who get the money first, that is, of course, always you, 
and then of course your immediate friends, you can still buy with the new money at the old low prices. Um, then prices gradually rise as the additional quantities of money ripple through the economy. But those people who get the new money last, or very late, or not at all, they are impoverished insofar as their income has not been uh, rising at all, but prices are in the meantime higher. Just imagine somebody who has a fixed income. So he is on a fixed income, but as a result of me, as in charge of the government, spending additional sums of money, all the prices, many prices, to different degrees, have risen. So my real income and my real wealth has fallen. I am poorer, and those people who spent the money first at initially lower prices are richer. So, so emphasize, again, as a very important insight, this is the most important insight that you can have about theory of money. The total quantity of money cannot increase, or increasing the total quantity of money cannot increase social wealth, but it can redistribute the existing wealth, make some groups in society richer at the expense of making other people poorer. Now, the problem for you and your friends with this institutional setup is not that it doesn't work. Uh, it works actually perfectly, always to your own and your friend's advantage, and always at the expense of others. All you have to do is avoid hyperinflation, uh, because in that case people would avoid using money and flee into real values, and they would just rob you, so to speak, of the magic wand that you, that you command. Um, the problem with your paper money monopoly, if there is one at all, is only that this fact will be immediately, or at least in short, in a short while, noticed also by others, and will be recognized as a big criminal ripoff that it in fact is. So it's not that it doesn't work, but people figured out that this is just a ripoff. But this problem can be overcome also. It can be overcome if, in addition to monopolizing the production of money, you also set yourself up as a banker and enter the banking business with the establishment of a central bank. Again, you just pass simply a law. It's not difficult to do. Uh, all states have done that. Because you can create paper money out of thin air, out of nothing, zero cost essentially, you can also create credit out of thin air. In fact, because you can create credit out of thin air, um, uh, out of nothing, without any savings on your part, you can offer loans at cheaper rates than anyone else can do. Uh, you can offer loans even at rates close to zero. It doesn't require any sacrifice on your part to make any loans. Uh, so you don't have to ask much, so to speak, in return for the loans that you, that you hand out. Um, with this ability of creating credit out of thin air and offering them as at low, extremely low interest rates, not only is your former dependency on banks and the banking industry eliminated, moreover, you can now make banks dependent on you, and you can forge a permanent alliance and complicity between banks and state. Let me just emphasize, this is one of the defining elements of the current monetary system, that there is a complicity between states and the banking, banking industry. You don't even have to become involved in the business of investing the credit yourself. That task and the risk involved in that task, you can safely leave to commercial banks. What you, your central bank, need to do is only this. 
you create credit out of thin air and then loan this money at below market interest rates to commercial banks. And instead of you paying interest to banks, banks now pay interest to you, to your central bank. And the banks in turn loan out your newly created easy credit to their business friends at somewhat, somewhat higher but still sub-market rates of interest to earn from the interest differential. And in addition, to make the banks especially keen on working with you, you may permit the banks to create a certain amount of their own new credit, of uh, new checkbook money that they can create out of thin air on top of the money credit that you created out of thin air. Um, and this is what we call fractional reserve banking. That is, you create money out of thin air and the banks on top of the reserves of money that you created create additional sums of money, checkbook money, also out of thin air. Now, what are the consequences of this type of monetary policy? Now, to a large extent, they are the same as the consequences of an easy money policy that I described before. Again, first, an easy credit policy is also inflationary. More money is brought into existence than existed before, and accordingly prices will be higher than they would otherwise have been, and the purchasing power of money will be lower than it otherwise would have been. And second, the credit expansion too has no effect on the quantity or quality of all goods that are currently in existence. It neither increases nor decreases their amount. More money is just this. It is just more pieces of paper. It does not and it cannot increase social wealth by one iota. And third, easy credit also engenders a systematic redistribution of social wealth in favor of you, the central bank, and the commercial banks within your banking cartel, which are the first recipients of your credit that you created out of thin air. You will receive an interest return on money that you have created at practically zero cost. Instead of on money that is costly saved out of an existing income. Again, just let me be absolutely clear here. When you extend a loan to somebody, uh, you must have saved something first in order to be able to give a loan. That is, involves a sacrifice on your part. When government grants credit or the central bank creates credit, there is no sacrifice on their part at all. They have not previously saved out of their existing income and then extend a loan. They have created the loan without any sacrifice on their part, without any savings on their part whatsoever. Now, uh, both you and your banker friends thereby appropriate an unearned income. You and the banks are enriched at the expense of all real money savers uh, who receive now a lower interest return than they otherwise would have received. That is, that they would have received without the injection of your and the bank's cheap credit into the credit market. On the other hand, there also exists a fundamental difference between an easy print and spend money monetary policy, as I described it first, you print it and you simply spend it on whatever you like, and the policy of an easy print and loan, mon loan out monetary policy. See the difference, again, you can print it and then spend it immediately on whatever you want, and you can of course also print it and then loan out the printed stuff uh, with the expectation that it will be paid back plus plus interest. So what's the difference between these two types of policy? First off, an easy credit policy alters the production structure uh, 
alters what is produced and by whom in a highly significant way. You, as a chief of the central bank, can create credit out of thin air. You do not have to first save money out of your money income. That is, you do not have to cut your own expenses and thus abstain from buying certain non-money goods as every normal person must if he extends a credit. You only have to turn on the printing press and can thus undercut any interest rate that is demanded of borrowers by savers otherwise at other places in the market. Uh, you can outcompete all others. Now granting credit does not involve any sacrifice on your part, which is why this institution from your point of view is such a nice institution. Is it, uh, extend a loan, no sacrifice, it's easy for me to extend loans. I can grant you loans as many as I want to all of you. <laughs> now, if things then go well, that is, you will be paid a positive interest return on your paper investment. And if they don't go well, no, well, as a monopoly producer of money, you can always make up losses more easily than anyone else. How? By covering your losses with even more printed paper. So without costs and no genuine personal risk of losses, you can grant credit essentially indiscriminately to everyone and for any purpose without any concern or with very little concern at least for the credit worthiness of the debtor or the soundness of his business plan. Because your easy credit, certain people, in particular investment bankers, who otherwise would not be deemed sufficiently credit worthy, and certain projects, in particular of banks and their main clients, that would not be considered profitable but wasteful or too risky, instead do get the credit and do get funding because there is no risk involved in you to be indiscriminate in your lending um, activities. And essentially the same applies to the commercial banks within your banking cartel. Because of their special relationship to you, namely as the first recipients of your costless low interest paper money credits, the banks too can offer loans to prospective lenders at interest rates below market interest rates. And again, if things go well for them, they go well. And if they don't, they can rely on you as the monopolistic producer of money that you will bail them out in the same way as you bail yourself out of any financial trouble, namely by more paper money printing. I do not have to emphasize that these sorts of things have been going on right now before our eyes in the present financial crisis. Accordingly, the banks too will be less discriminating in the selection of their clients and their business plans and more prone to funding the wrong people and the wrong projects that we had a huge housing bubble in the United States was not due to some errors or something like that. It was, was due, due to the fact that interest rates were offered to people who had practically uh, were, uh, huge credit risk, so to speak, at almost zero rates. Um, without this incentive created, so to speak, by loose credit policies, the housing bubble would never have been able to emerge in the first place. You didn't even have to have a job. You didn't even have to have any credit or history whatsoever and still got practically zero interest loans from the banks. They almost pushed it on you. Why don't you buy a house? Interest rates are almost zero. You don't have to have a job. You don't have to be uh, able to just prove that you have a credit history that shows that you will be able to repay, that you have done that so in the past. Nothing of these requirements existed. Why could banks do that? Because banks couldn't 
offer credit at these low rates. Why could they offer at these low rates? Because credit was created out of thin air. And then there is a second significant difference between a print and spend and a print and then loan policy. And this difference explains why the income and wealth redistribution in your own favor and in the favor of your banker friends that is set in motion by an easy credit policy takes a specific form of a temporal boom-bust cycle that is of an initial phase of seeming general prosperity or more precisely of expected increases in future incomes and wealth which then is followed by a phase of widespread impoverishment when the prosperity of the boom or the expected prosperity of the boom phase is revealed as a widespread illusion. Now this boom bust feature is the logical and indeed also the physically necessary consequence of credit created out of thin air or as it is sometimes also called as of credit that is unbacked by savings or the term that Mises uses of fiduciary credit um, or whatever other term we might use for this type of credit um, and of the fact that every investment of course takes some time and only shows later on, somewhere in the future, more distant future, uh, whether the investment was successful or not. Investments take time to find out were they right or wrong. If I buy a sandwich, I have my result immediately, whether that was successful or not. But if I build something that I is expected to bring some result in the future, then of course it takes time before we find out was it good, was it a bad buy, a lousy buy, or was it a smart thing to do. Now the reason for the business cycle is in a way very elementary but also very fundamental and I want to explain that by a very simple example which I think however is very powerful. Imagine Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe can give a loan of fish which he has not consumed to Friday. So he has produces fish. Uh, he doesn't consume all of the fish. Uh, some of the fish that he doesn't consume he hands over as a loan to Friday. We call this a commodity credit. The credit does not consist in pieces of money or something. This is just a, a real good handed over as a loan. Now Friday then can convert these savings, the fish that he has received, into a fishing net in the following way. He can eat the fish while he constructs the net. It's important that what he does here, yes, the fish is eaten now by Friday, but it is not just pure consumption. It is productive consumption. It is he, produce, he produces a net. Once the fish is eaten up, the situation is not that there's nothing there, but there is then in place a net. And with the help of the net, which allows him to be more productive, product, production with capital goods is more uh, productive than production without capital goods. That's why we bring capital goods into existence. Um, so in converting his savings, or Robinson's savings, his loan, the fish, into a fishing net, um, uh, he can then, in principle, Friday, uh, do the following. He can repay his loan to Robinson. He can pay Robinson an interest return. That is, he can give him more fish back than he actually loaned from him in the first place. Uh, and 
Friday can on top of that still earn a profit of additional fish for himself. This is the normal process that takes place when an economy grows. But all of this is physically impossible if Robinson's loan is only a paper note denominated in fish. It says, this is a loan of one fish. Um, but unbacked by any real fish. That is, Robinson has, in fact, eaten up all the fish. But the note says, one fish. Um, now, then, if that were the case, um, it should be clear that Friday must fail in his investment endeavor. Um, in a simple barter economy, of course, this becomes immediately apparent. I mean, Friday immediately realizes this is just a note backed by absolutely nothing. Um, and he will not begin his investment project. He will not start working on the net because he knows I have to eat while the net is being built and there is nothing that I can eat because it's just a piece of paper. Um, so the boom and bust cycle, so to speak, would not develop in a simple barter, barter economy. But in a complex monetary economy, the fact that credit was created out of thin air is not immediately noticeable. Every credit note looks like any other. And because of this, the notes are accepted by the takers of credit. Friday would not accept it in a primitive barter economy. We can't tell whether it is just a note that is backed by nothing or a note that is backed by, by something. So there is no difficulty just finding takers for our notes that we distribute around. But all of this does not change the fundamental fact of reality that nothing can be produced out of nothing. And that investment projects that are undertaken without any real funding whatsoever, that is, without any previous savings whatsoever, must fail. But it explains why a boom, that is, an increased level of investment accompanied by the expectation of higher future standards of living um, can get started. Um, Friday, so to speak, using the example again, Friday does accept the note instead of immediately refusing it and begins working on the net and only realizes after a while that the funds are simply not there in order to complete the net and then make it possible for him to repay the loan plus interest and make a profit for himself on top of it. Um, so in a complex economy, it explains then why it then takes a while until the physical reality reasserts itself and reveals then that these former expectations in the boom were just illusions. But then, what, what is a little crisis to you? And recall, you are in charge of the government and the central bank. So what if there are little crises? Even if your path to riches is through repeated crises, brought about by your paper money regime and central banking policies, from your point of view, that is from the viewpoint, as the head of state and the chief of the central bank, this form of print and loan wealth redistribution in your own and your banker's friend, while it is less immediate than the redistribution achieved with a simple print and then spend policy is still much to be preferred because it is far more difficult to see through and to recognize for what it in fact is. Instead of coming across as a plain fraud and parasite, 
in pursuing an easy credit policy, you can even pretend that you are engaged in the selfless task of investing in the future. <laughs> instead of spending on present frivolities, and you can even pretend that you are healing economic crisis instead of being the one who has actually caused them. And I think we live in a hilarious world, and I described how it works. This, this is a world we live in. Uh, very few people understand it. I hope I have helped you a little bit to realize what sort of scam is going on before our eyes, and what sort of outrageous lies we are told by those who are responsible for these crises. Thank you very much.